Hi, I'm Kelly Kramer. And I'm Scott Sipker. Welcome to Southwest Iowa. And Sunnyside Park in Atlantic on Iowa Outdoors. Coming up on this episode of Iowa Outdoors. We'll travel to Southeast Iowa for an annual celebration that highlights the arrival of bald eagles. Join up with Boy Scouts from across the state learning how to survive the worst winter has to offer. And follow a handful of Iowa communities taking part in a year-long public tree inventory. We'll have all that and more. So sit tight, Iowa Outdoors is about to begin. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. Iowa Communications Network, ICN's Broadband Matters campaign advocates for access to high-speed broadband in all corners of Iowa for education, public safety, health care, government, and economic development. Information is available at broadbandmatters.com. Tiny openings around your house can let in a lot of cold air. This includes areas where you see light coming in, especially around windows, doors, and outlets. With the heating season approaching, Alliant Energy encourages you to weatherize now to make your home more energy efficient. Winter is without question the harshest time of year to enjoy the outdoors. But there are still a multitude of activities that take advantage of the low temperatures that drive Iowans across the state out into the inclement weather. Some adventures can't be undertaken until the temperature dips below freezing. While that certainly can deter some from partaking, for the rest, that barrier makes for a very special experience. One creature that absolutely thrives in the cold weather is the bald eagle. With its numerous waterways, Iowa has become a haven for this national icon. Come winter, hundreds of bald eagles can be seen in the Iowa skies, with several cities honoring their arrival. For over 30 years, Keokuk has done just that, celebrating the hundreds of bald eagles that make their nest along the Mississippi and its annual Bald Eagle Appreciation Days. Come January, bird lovers from across the nation will descend on this small river town in hopes of seeing skies full of eagles. If you're looking for a place to take in the majesty of one of our nation's symbols, the bald eagle, there may be no better location than Keokuk and its January tradition of bald eagle appreciation days. Keokuk actually started it uh, with the idea of trying to develop uh, an appreciation for the eagles and understanding of, of what impact uh, human activities had had and also what people could do to uh, hopefully uh, bring the eagles back from that brink of extinction that they were at in the 60s. Estimated in the 1800s to have a population near 500,000 birds, by the mid-1950s, decades of unregulated hunting mixed with the pesticide DDT had pushed the bald eagle population below 500. Nearly extinct, the federal government made it illegal to hunt bald eagles in the 1940s, and in 1972, a sweeping EPA regulation banned the use of DDT, the most detrimental agent to eagle mortality. Let's not lose sight of the fact that these birds are here in a, in a very positive manner to show us that if we make choices, hard choices for the environment, it's really phenomenal. And, and I think sharing that appreciation is what we really need to do. So bald eagles are once again thriving and easily seen along Iowa waterways. And in Keokuk, the perfect destination for bald eagle viewing can be found thanks to the lock and dam system placed at the confluence of the Des Moines and Mississippi rivers. Keokuk happens to be one of the top five or six places in the country where they tend to congregate. And open water is, is the main reason. Uh, the lock and dam here in Keokuk uh, helps to keep the ice off of the water and they get uh, their, uh, the primary feeding that they do in the wintertime is, is feeding off of fish. But Illinois has done a tremendous uh, service to the bald eagle as well by protecting the, the trees that are across the river from here in Keokuk 
as a, both a night roosting area where the birds can uh, gather together at night and then also for day perches where they actually will sit and roost looking for their food sources. Tom Buckley is a Lee County conservationist who has been an ardent eagle spectator for years. Helping organize the event, he sees multiple reasons why visitors drive for miles to attend Bald Eagle Appreciation Days. I think obviously being our national symbol it's, is something that uh, uh, people recognize. You see them on the top of a flagpole that's on our money. It's on a lot of different things that, that help identify us as Americans. They're just, they're quite incredible animals and, and there's just a majesty there that I think is attractive to a lot of people. As event attendance continues to soar, the DNR and the Lee County Conservation Board work to educate visitors on the proper way to interact with eagles. But we do a lot of the ethical discussion on not loving them to death or not loving them to where you're harassing them by getting too close. So we want people to stay in their automobiles. They want us want to utilize our spotting scopes, let them have their fishing, have, have all that biology taken care of before we impose what we're doing. But we're pretty passive. I mean, it's easy to feel good watching eagles. So it, it kind of lends uh, back and forth. And, and the eagles really put on remarkable shows. Those shows draw bird lovers from all over. Randy Davidson is a Keokuk native who currently lives in Oklahoma. And even though his home is 500 miles away, his love of photographing eagles has driven him to visit Keokuk for the bird's annual return. Nothing compares to the bald eagle, nothing. It's, they're just spectacular. Their wingspan is, is just majestic, and, they're, and we have them in Oklahoma, but not like we have them here. Unlike birds that commonly fly south for the winter, eagles prefer the abject cold. So winter days where temperatures are unseasonably warm, eagle sightings may be few and far between. Still, if you keep your camera ready, you could capture a once-in-a-lifetime shot. I've only seen like four or five today. I think there's more with the scopes on the Illinois side. Uh, but I have some friends that are photographers that had a shot of about 50 in one shot. So there's plenty around here. You just have to be patient and, and willing to dig for it. Braving the cold can be a lot to ask of some people in the middle of January in Iowa. But when that request is to watch a convocation of eagles soaring through the air, it's no wonder Bald Eagle Appreciation Days regularly sees more than 5,000 visitors. In 31 years and we continue to see our numbers steadily grow and I think it's, it's a huge credit to the tourism department here in, in Keokuk that we, we've focused an awful lot on the eagles over the years but looking at other conservation topics to introduce the public to other things that they may want to uh, take interest in but it's I think it's just a good time of year for people to have something to do get get out of that little cabin fever they may have from sitting around all, all winter long so far. While winter can be a great time to get outdoors and experience our world in a unique backdrop, it can quickly turn from exciting to dangerous. Threats such as hypothermia and falls on ice can become treacherous, and being prepared can mean the difference between life and death. Living by its Be Prepared motto, the Mid-Iowa Council of the Boy Scouts of America recognizes this, and every year trains its scouts for it. Held annually in Ames, ROTC staff and cadets educate scouts on how to build fires, find food, make shelter, and many other manners of surviving the worst winter has to offer. At its purest, the Boy Scouts of America exist to show young boys all the outdoors has to offer. And whether it's 90 degrees in the middle of summer or sub-freezing temperatures in the dead of winter, you will find scouts outside experiencing it. A lot of the Boy Scouts, one of their goals is to go camping every month of the year, one weekend of the month of the year, and that includes December, January, February, which is pretty cold. We usually try to hold the winter survival training, that way they get some experience on what they need to do to prepare for it. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God country. For nearly 30 years, come January, Boy Scouts from across the state have traveled to Ames to take part in winter survival training. Taught by Iowa State's ROTC cadets, the event prepares scouts to enjoy winter safely and learn how to survive should an outing become dangerous. They break out into uh, two groups. One group starts out with indoor training, kind of classroom type training, and the other half of the, uh, the group goes outside and does hands-on experiences. They get to learn um, how to build a shelter in the winter without a tent, 
find food and how to dress for the winter, how to stay warm overnight. I think boys join Boy Scouts, first of all, to get outside and, and do outdoor activities. Paul Haywood is an assistant scoutmaster for Troop 334 out of Eldora. His small crew of scouts attending the event perfectly represents who wants to attend survival training and what they're likely to take home. The four boys I brought today are new to this um, event. They don't realize how much is involved in preparing and training for taking on certain events. And the more we prepare before we do our outings, the more fun we have. Winter survival training would not be the same without its host, the Iowa State University Armory and its ROTC cadets teaching the classes. Just like Boy Scouts, ROTC is about training young men, so having cadets and scouts working together makes perfect sense. Well, ROTC in general is developing leaders to become future officers in the United States Army, and we take this event to help prepare them in leadership. So we have designated class leaders. There's different eight different classes that are being taught eight different times. So it goes along not just survival, but that's what the premises is, but for everyday situations. Does anybody know the difference between a boil and a rolling boil? <laughs> Todd Epperly has been organizing the training for more than 10 years. And every year, he sees scouts light up from their interaction with the ROTC. The kids and scouts, a lot of them have military aspirations. And they get to build relationships with these guys and see them and go, hey, that's something I want to do in a, in a couple of years. As all the Boy Scouts see, they see us all in uniform. Therefore, it produces tons of questions. And then for us, to answer those questions helps us, obviously, with our leadership. And if you were to ask one of the attendees why they're in Scouts, they'd say it's outdoor experiences just like this. My favorite thing about Boy Scouts is probably exploring, trailblazing. I wanted to come to Winter Survival because we are currently going over in our, our troop, uh, Wilderness Survival in general, so we decided to go over Winter as uh, just an extra thing. While TJ is an experienced scout who's backpacked through some of the more treacherous terrain adventurers can encounter, even he walked away from the event with a host of new winter survival knowledge. Uh, like the different layers and how many that you actually need to survive in the wilderness. I thought like a sweatshirt and a coat thing would be good, but I guess not. You, there's a whole bunch of different layers like the, the dry fits and then the waffle things and the fleeces and then the, the Gore-Tex things and you know, he just keeps going on. By the end of training, scouts head home with a new respect and understanding of what it takes to survive the perils of winter. While they may not retain all of its lessons, winter survival training is another step towards Boy Scouts' overall goal. Boy Scouts prepares uh, young men for life. And um, in situations that, that uh, might occur throughout their lives, um, Boy Scout training always will play a part in their choices that they make, you know. Um, what impact am I going to have on this situation? What if I do this, what's going to happen here? And, you know, we, like, we want to teach them to keep that in the back of their mind every time they have to make a decision. One way to tell the year is coming to a close is the trees. Come December, the beautiful color is gone, replaced by dormant limbs waiting for the calendar to reset and spring to come. Besides their shade and picturesque fall appearance, many of us take for granted Iowa's most abundant resident. Truth is, trees add a great deal to our lives. Everything from improving our mental health to increasing our property values. In 2015, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources worked with communities across the state to diagnose the health and population of our publicly cared for trees, revealing a surprising amount about Iowa's woodland population. I think that folks in Iowa do not have a full appreciation of the benefits that trees bring us. You know, this is a farm state, and before that it was a prairie state, and I think while we may not have an appreciation of trees in general, everybody has a connection to a tree. A tree that they grew up with, a tree that they climbed, a tree that they had their first kiss under, whatever that may be. Of all 50 states, Iowa has the most altered landscape in the nation. Before pioneers crossed the Mississippi, the Iowa countryside was dominated by wild prairie grass and intermittent woodland and wetland areas. Now, after centuries of progress, our state is painted with thousands of acres of farmland, 
roads, buildings, and communities. And while less than 1% of our state's prairie grass remains, Iowans have made a concerted effort to reforest our public spaces with a plethora of trees. The value in community trees is enormous. There are economic, social, and environmental uh, impacts from urban trees, and usually we think about the environmental impacts, the stormwater runoff reduction, for instance, or the small particulate removal uh, for air quality. But there's so much more than that. We also have things like the health of the community. We see a lot of research about how having a larger tree canopy increases the health. We have reduced risk of stroke, of heart attacks when we have larger tree canopy, lower levels of obesity, lower levels of asthma, lower symptoms of ADHD, and the list goes on and on and on. Recognizing the value urban trees bring, 10 Iowa communities, along with the DNR, set out in 2015 on an ambitious three-year plan to take stock of their publicly maintained trees and fully diagnose the health of their civic wooded areas. This is a grant that I wrote uh, for Forest Service funds to provide training and assistance to communities across Iowa. So we're teaching tree identification, forest health, signs and symptoms of various pests and diseases, hazard tree assessment, how to collect data on a GPS data collector, and we'll really have a plan moving forward for how many trees they need to remove, treat, plant, maintain in a year. We start with some basic tree ID, and of course, you know, the question, why is it important? You know, the core of figuring out <coughs> what you do with whatever it is, bug or whatever it is you have, starts with tree ID. As the leaves of spring begin to bud, district foresters, such as Charles City's Jason Walker, start the tree inventory process. But before participants can start taking stock of the trees in their community, they must learn how to decipher a spruce from a cedar, an oak from an ash, and so on for the dozens of species of trees in Iowa. Many of the quick things, of course, the obvious things that you see when you walk up to the trees, if it's the summertime, the leaves, you know, are, are very uh, you know, important uh, characteristics that uh, many people uh, find the easiest to help identify trees. Um, after you've done it for a while, you tend to look at the uh, bark or uh, maybe the general overall shape or structure of the tree, which is going to be a, a good indication of uh, many of the different species we have. All 10 participating communities start with a day jam-packed with identification material. Considering the amount of information to learn and the short period allotted, it quickly becomes apparent this course is but a short look into a much larger world of knowledge. I think the key is, you know, in the short time that we have them, we're not going to make them tree experts. They're not going to be able to go out in the park and, ever and identify every tree. We want them to feel comfortable with the material we give them. While overloaded, these courses are designed to build a foundation of tree identification and maintenance requirements. And as the year progresses, forester guidance will help push participants from being novices to competent tree identifiers. We give them a lot of reference material, key books that are going to help them be able to correctly identify species. So if we meet multiple times, each time we meet, hopefully we'll learn new species, learn specific characteristics, and they'll just become more comfortable trying to identify trees. Okay. All right, this one. As spring progresses, communities leave the classroom and start applying their knowledge outdoors. Sometimes you're going to walk up to a tree and you're going to know just what it is right off the bat. But if you're not at that point, what you're trying to do is, is take it from all these trees down to this little group and then maybe figure out what's in, what it is out of that little group. And Muscatine, as with all inventory efforts, tree ID starts with the basics. First, if a tree is conifer or deciduous. Second, finding the bud where leaves sprout from a branch. Third, identifying alternate, opposite, or world leaf arrangement. And finally, investigating the leaves, fruit, thorns, and overall form of the tree. See how this has a branch coming off here, branch here on opposite sides of the, of the main branch? The other form is alternate, remember? So it's whether they branch together coming off of the main stem or individually. And that goes for not only how the twigs are arranged on the branch, but also leaves are arranged on the twigs. Throughout Iowa, April and May allow participants to test out their tree ID skills, but the actual public inventory process waits for the summer. To best make use of the spring, 
community's transition to planting. As part of the forestry grant, each community received an allotment of fresh saplings, and before the inventory courses began, their placement was decided. In Muscatine, it was the community soccer fields. In Fairfield, a local park. While only a handful will be planted, these trees represent a first step in a statewide pledge to urban woodlands. So part of the commitment that the communities have made when they applied for this is that they will change uh, their code to include trees on their streets, for instance, to increase ways to plant trees for uh, citizens, and to set goals and actively plan to increase our urban tree canopy. In Pleasant Hill, Parks and Recreation Supervisor Heath Ellis personally saw the value in trees. But before his city could take part in the inventory process, city officials needed to be invested as well. I've loved working with trees all my life. But when you bring it into an urban setting, um, it's a whole different ball game. Every community uh, struggles with that. They struggle with creating a budget and they struggle with having a management plan. And you can't do that until you get elected people in your city management to really have a greater understanding of how urban trees can benefit the community. When we see tree-lined uh, downtowns, uh, people tend to drive farther to shop there, they spend longer, and they spend more money. But we also see a lot of social impacts in terms of people having place attachment to their community, people spending more time talking to neighbors, and reduction in crime rates just by having a nice canopy of trees in your downtown area. As spring turns to summer, leaves come to full bloom, allowing the inventory process to take off. Using tools both traditional and digitally enhanced, participants start cataloging every public tree. So we're using a data collection unit. We're collecting size, um, what condition it's in, if any treatment should happen, such as pruning, um, and that's all saved to its location. So later on, the community can go to that on the map and find out more about their trees. While constructing the inventory is a long, repetitive task, it will ultimately help build a six-year tree management plan for each community. That plan will better help communities understand their overall species composition, as well as fully grasp hazard and pest control needs. And with invasive species becoming a serious concern, that information will be extremely valuable. We're preparing for emerald ash borer, so we really want to know how many ash do we have so that uh, we can plan for that. But in addition, that's also going to tell us what, should, what we should plant next, because we want to make sure that we're planting a lot of different species so we don't have a huge impact like emerald ash borer will have on the community. Most communities have about 17% ash, so we need a real plan for how to handle that. And without knowing where the ash are and what the whole composition of the urban forest is, it's hard to make a plan. So if we know that we're going to lose up to 17% of our tree canopy across the state because of an emerald ash borer, we're going to really have to work hard just to maintain that canopy. So it's really not a five-year goal, it's more like a decades-long goal. With threats such as the emerald ash borer looming, the inventory continues. And in Pleasant Hill, the feel of cataloging wasn't one of concern, but excitement, as the crew discovered a state record-breaking red oak. So this would be the largest one in the state then? This Lord. is the largest one in the state. My Lord. Yeah, largest one registered in the state. Yeah. Probably one of my favorite parts was um, the counting and working with the GIS systems. And you kind of find out, wow, um, I got a lot of maples, or I, you know, we got an abundance of a certain species. Um, so that really helped, so you kind of had some enthusiasm and excitement saying, hey, yeah, we know what we need to diversify in. So I, looked for, I really looked forward to knowing more information on the tree inventory as we move forward. As summer fades, the tree inventory process comes to a close, and all that remains in the year-long course is pruning. While generally held until the late fall or winter, DNR foresters push pruning up so the last session can be completed before weather gets in the way of the project's objectives. I think a lot of times people, folks, folks think you just plant a tree, you walk away, and in 50 years you're going to have this big, beautiful tree. But I think when you start to teach them and talk to them about it, um, they go, wow, I mean, this, 
This is going to take some work, some planning, funding. When you start putting a dollar amount to it, they start going, wow, really realizing how important they are and, and what a big impact they have on our daily lives, too. This year we have 10 communities we work with, and next year we'll have another 10. And we see the impact as actively managing our urban forests and actually increasing tree canopy. Then we can start getting businesses, corporations, civic groups, community members involved because they see all the benefits. That wraps up this edition of Iowa Outdoors. We encourage you to get outside and enjoy one of Iowa's many parks and recreation areas, like Sunnyside Park here in Atlantic. If you're planning any outdoors travel, check out our extensive video archive of adventures from across the state at iptv.org slash Iowa Outdoors. As our fifth season of Iowa Outdoors comes to a close, we'll leave you with one last look at the trees of Iowa, along with a reading of Edgar A. Guest's As Fall of Leaves. We'll see you next year for the sixth season of Iowa Outdoors. As fall the leaves, so drop the days in silence from the tree of life. Born for a little while to blaze in action in the heat of strife, and then to shrivel with time's blast and fade forever in the past. In beauty once the leaf was seen, to all it offered gentle shade. Men knew the splendor of its green that cheered them so would quickly fade. And quickly, too, must pass away all that is splendid of today. To try to keep the leaves were vain. Men understand they must fall. Why should they bitterly complain when sorrows come to one and all? Why should they mourn the passing day that must depart along the way? Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. Iowa Communications Network, ICN's Broadband Matters campaign advocates for access to high-speed broadband in all corners of Iowa for education, public safety, health care, government, and economic development. Information is available at broadbandmatters.com. Tiny openings around your house can let in a lot of cold air. This includes areas where you see light coming in, especially around windows, doors, and outlets. With the heating season approaching, Alliant Energy encourages you to weatherize now to make your home more energy efficient.